I'm going to get started. So um, good morning, everyone. Again, welcome. Um, this is day two of our um, sort of 10-year anniversary. Last uh, week, we, um, we did a 10 years looking back. Um, today is going to be all about looking forward the next 10 years. Um, we have an amazing keynote uh, with Brett Friedman, the New York State uh, Medicaid um, director, as well as two panels um, about the impact of COVID, sort of what has COVID done in terms of the impact on the pandemic. Um, the panel is going to be moderated by Bianca, our medical director, and the other panel will be moderated by me about sort of just leadership and management in this really uncertain times. Um, again, last last week we we celebrated 10 years of significant accomplishments. We had a keynote um, from Donna that really, Donna Colonna, who was sort of a, the board chair and one of the founders, and she really was able to lay out some of the historical context of how CBC, you know, came to life and what we've what we've accomplished over the last um, 10 years. We had two panels, um, one on Pathway Home and the other on our care management program, um, really highlighting a lot of the uh, the work that we do. Um, it was really great to be able to acknowledge um, that and, and recognize how far we've come. But today's really all about the future and, and what we hopefully will be able to accomplish in the next 10 years. And, and uh, it's really about, from my perspective, and sort of, you know, this is sort of my last hurrah here with CBC, um, Friday's my last day, but really about pushing CBC and, and the whole network to really raise the bar and really continue to challenge ourselves so that we could really collectively um, continue to trailblaze around improving the lives of the of the folks that we we see in day in day out. That's that's why we do all this. This is why I think I get up in the morning is to make sure that you know those that are you know sort of at, at a disadvantage and need our services you know can access them in in a sort of seamless um, way. So um, that I think is what drives all of us. So this is about the next. 10 years. Um, so with that, I'm really excited about introducing our keynote. Many of you know Brett Friedman. He um, is the, the New York State Medicaid director. For those that don't know, um, Brett was CBC's counsel from the get-go. He was involved, I think, from the very beginning. Uh, when I came on board, I was incredibly impressed um, at the mastery of his mastery of the healthcare landscape, all around all, all sort of his deep knowledge around the behavioral health space keen intellect and his ability to really be able to distill a lot of the arcane legal concepts about IPAs and all the other stuff that went along with sort of my, my steep learning curve of being at CBC into really digestible bits of information. Uh, and most importantly, what I love about Fred is just, just his passion for the work that we all do. Um, being now in Albany and in his current role, I think in my estimation is ideal for us as a sector, you know, if we're ever going to really be able to fix the system and, and get on track with, you know, community based um, providers and, you know, consumers being at the front um, and center of a lot of the discussions. Um, I can't think of a better person to do that than, than Brett. Um, and I'm really excited about him joining us today. And um, Brett, you're on. Hi, everyone. Um George, thank you for that intro. Um, you know, when when George and CBC invited me to give the keynote today, uh, I jumped at the opportunity because there are very few instances in which uh, I have the benefit of seeing uh, an organization grow from really, you know, from the ground up um, and think about how to navigate what has been uh, a convoluted strategy in behavioral health and Medicaid over the last 10 years. Uh, and to George's credit to the amazing CBC and CBC IPA boards um, with, you know, Donna Colonna leading the helm. Um, CBC has done a remarkable job um, responding to what has been uh, an inherently uncertain Medicaid and behavioral health landscape over the last 10 years. Um, and the fact that CBC stands here 10 years later, strong, organized, well-positioned um, is a testament to the leadership and vision of all of you here today. Uh, and so in thinking about what to do for this keynote address, um, it's to connect the pieces. Um, you know, as, as George mentioned, we've given a lot of thought, I'm gonna start projecting slides here. Um, we've given a lot of thought over the last, you know, year or so about the struggles and challenges at the full integration of behavioral health into managed care. It has not been uh, an, an easy road um, for, for very many reasons. Um, and 
one of my chief strategic initiatives uh, as the Medicaid director for the last 10 or so months has been how do we position behavioral health for a future in managed care? Um, and you know, to, to, to hit on George's point about trying to distill information down to the core elements, um, and apologies for my, what have become very rudimentary PowerPoint skills. Um, my goal here today is to try and connect the puzzle pieces of behavioral health and managed care. Um, and there's, there's three pieces that we're trying to connect um, in the Medicaid program. And I wanna talk briefly about each of those um, coming to this keynote because CBC as, you know, in, 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 in my estimation, the premier behavioral health IPA um, that has positioned its members and its network providers for participating in effective behavioral health value-based payment arrangements. Um, it's important to know how all of our seemingly disparate things are intended to work together to promote behavioral health at the forefront of an individual's journey, whether they're an individual with SMI or SUD uh, or, you know, less significant or severe behavioral health issues. Um, and so we have been embarking, you know, actually quite recently, the, 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 the chips of the puzzle pieces are falling into place um, using a three-part strategy for trying to have more effective behavioral health into managed care. Um, the first has been a value-based payment update. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means, but really what, what, this, what, what, what is causing this is we had DISRIP. DISRIP was a, was a transformational program that lasted from 2014 through March of 2020. The goal of DISRIP, or at least one of the top level goals of DISRIP was to ready the provider community for effective forms of value-based payment. Since the expiration of DISRIP, which coincided with the, with, with the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we've been in a, a holding pattern on value-based payment. The, the outward directions of the Medicaid program and the Department of Health has been continued down the path of value-based payment, but we didn't have an operative waiver. We didn't have an updated value-based payment roadmap. We have no guidance given to the field about what our expectations are and will be vis-a-vis value-based payment. And so puzzle piece number one is let's make sure that we're clear on our expect our current expectations on value-based payment. The second, and this has been quite controversial in the last two weeks because it was an outgrowth of the of this year's executive budget um, announced two weeks ago, um, is a quite ambitious managed care reform strategy with a focus on uh, the HARP line of business, um, as well as the ways that mainstream plans provide behavioral health benefits as part of that benefit package. We're looking to take very aggressive steps, which we think are common sense and, and important um, in terms of reforming managed care through a competitive procurement. Uh, and we'll talk about what that means and how it fits into the larger framework. Um, and then the third, and it's the slightly longer term vision, and I know I've spoken with many of you about this through your presentations over the last you know, 10 or so months, is working to submit a revised or a new 1115 waiver amendment to CMS to create the successor program for DISRIP that really looks to put behavioral health, behavioral health entities and community-based organizations at the center of an individual's care journey um, through uh, and to, to achieve a top level goal of promoting health equity in the Medicaid program. Um, these three strategies aren't working together, but they're part of a larger puzzle that we're clipping together um, as we look to position providers who want to do the work, who believe in the power of effective care management, effective primary care and behavioral health integration and whole person care into the forefront of the member's care journey. So I'll talk briefly about all of these and how they work together so that people hopefully here have a sense of what our long-term vision is in making managed care effective for behavioral health. Um, the first piece, uh, and this is the current piece ongoing, is the value-based payment update. Um, background here, as I quickly mentioned, when district expired in March of 2020, um, we had this value-based payment roadmap, that 92-page document that's been on our website and updated periodically over the course of DISRIP. It serves as the foundational document 
that governed the Medicaid program's expectations for managed care organizations and providers to move towards effective diet based payments. This is the document that established the level one upside only, level two upside downside, level three fully prepaid capitation arrangements. It guided how the department reviews and approves value based payment arrangements. And importantly, it set the percentage based expectations on MCOs and requirements. That was backed up with a penalty provision that if managed care plans didn't effectively contract um, with at least 80% level one and 35% level two, that we could penalize them for failing to meet our contractual requirements. Um, given that from March of 2020 until now, approaching two years, we haven't had um, a, a real live value-based payment roadmap. And without a roadmap, we don't have a document to point to to tell both MCOs and providers what we expect. Um, and so we have initiated, uh, as of two weeks ago, um, and we're currently in a public comment process, um, on a value-based payment roadmap update. Um, the update is not terribly substantive, um, and that's by design, right? We're just trying to reinforce the current and re-articulate the current expectations when the more substantive update is going to be part of that 1115 waiver that I mentioned two slides ago. But in the current environment, we wanted them to reinforce DOH's expectations on the current design of PVP arrangements. We wanted to work to streamline the roadmap to more clearly identify the contracting requirements and expectations. Um, to the extent we can make technical clarifications or move out outdated references, we did that. And through this public comment period, which is ongoing, we wanted to collect feedback from folks, including many people on this call, about how we can substantially improve value-based payment as we start negotiating and entering into the next 1115 waiver. Um, in doing that, um, we again tried to reorganize and distill the roadmap into its core pieces. Um, there's now an introduction. Um, we have very specific requirements. And so for those of you who have read our 90 plus page roadmap that's been on the website for the last couple of years. Um, it's a narrative, it's a journey. Um, while it's an interesting read for those of you who have the time, um, it's not a very, it wasn't in my view, and some of you kind of lived and worked with it, a very helpful document in terms of really distilling down what the expectations and requirements were on plans and providers uh, in entering into these arrangements. So we um, distilled that document down into the core requirements. Um, there are general requirements that apply to all arrangements, followed by arrangement specific requirements and reporting requirements for those arrangements. We broke out supporting documents. So any guidance that BVC contractors require in continuing to move through the contracting process, as well as relevant links. We wanted the document to itself be a central uh, source, but without being so long, it's really sort of navigating what you need. And then we moved. Um, you know, we moved a lot of the, you know, still relevant, but less direct information in terms of entering into these arrangements into an appendix. So definitions, previous program guidelines, um, descriptions of, you know, of, of some of the more programmatic elements. So the document itself really becomes a guide. It really becomes the instruction sheet. Um, and so the end result is a 90 page roadmap that's down to 23 pages with 14 pages of requirements and nine pages of appendices. Um, there's now seven general requirements, three arrangement specific requirements, two reporting requirements, and two off menu arrangement requirements. It's, you know, designed to be something that people, again, can sort of live and use in the normal course, and that clearly conveys our expectations in the current environment to maintain and retain the momentum that we've achieved um, in value-based payment. It doesn't mean that we agree with within the value-based payment roadmap in its entirety. We have heard the criticism, which I fully agree with, that the structure and nature of the current value-based payment design has left behavioral health providers out in the cold um, in the sense that it's focused on total cost of care arrangements, it's focused on primary care, as opposed to Article 31 or other forms of behavioral health attribution. Um, we haven't been as specific as we needed to be in terms of behavioral health measure sets and how to use those measure sets to incentivize MCOs to really prioritize the right level of intervention. Those reforms are, you know, we're, we're, we're looking to revise the bigger structure through the 1115 waiver, which I'll talk about. Um, but 
you know, we want to make sure that we don't lose momentum now until we get there because the timeline is, you know, really up to CMS. Uh, but in the value-based payment roadmap, we did want to reinforce some of the areas that we're going to double down on when we move into the next 1115 waiver. Social determinants of health. Um, while the SDH requirements have not changed and that level two and level three arrangements are still required to address at least one social determinant of health, um, the, we, we tried to both clarify what that means, um, provide more examples of common SDH interventions from the existing SDH intervention menu, um, as well as we wanted to try and fix some of, at least I was confused about what CBO tiers mean and whether it's a tier one or tier two CBO and how they get incorporated into the arrangement. We tried to clarify because SDH interventions remain a core component of value-based payment for us, how to keep that structured. Um, we provided more VVP guiding principles um, to reiterate the state's expectations for contractors and providers. Um, we've tried to better incorporate quality measures. Um, again, we think driving quality measures help um, ensure that VVP arrangements don't result in inappropriate stinting of care, but also encourage MCOs to focus on the right types of interventions. And there's been a way to improve the primacy of behavioral health in those arrangements. Um, and we provided a list of acceptable exclusions from the roadmap um, so that it's clear what can be essentially taken out, right? Like transplants, always a big example, right? You don't wanna be at risk for transplants, but there's other things that we put in for exclusions that we help clarify. So again, this is what we could do short-term to try and clear the field, reinforce our expectations, not lose momentum. Um, as we've come through COVID um, or we're coming through COVID, we keep thinking it's ending. Um, and we, you know, to ensure that MCOs continue to work with IPAs and providers to enter into effective DBP. Um, the next piece, which is managed care reform. Um, and this is again, very new, um, hotly, hotly debated. I don't know where it's gonna shake out in the course of the budget, but we within the department, I mean, personally feel very strongly about what this means for the future of behavioral health and managed care. Um, Part P of the health and mental hygiene bill announced in the governor's executive budget proposes a competitive procurement for HARP, mainstream, MLPC, and MAP products. Um, as background, uh, and this, you know, some of these facts were shocking to me, um, there are 40 states in the country that have meaningful Medicaid managed care programs. Of those 40 states, 37 states competitively procure their managed care products in some way. Um, what are the remaining three states? New York is one of them um, and is by far the largest Medicaid program of those three states. The other two states, I don't have them on top of my head, but are, are minuscule Medicaid programs with two or three plans naturally in the market. We have 26 MLPCs, 12 mainstream, 12 HARP, um, and nine MAP plans that currently serve the New York market. Um, those plans have never been competitively procured, and these are our largest state contracts, period. Um, and by not competitively procuring, we lose opportunities to create efficiencies, to create commitment for plans to play the long game in the New York market. Um, and so what happens, and it's not to say that all plans are this way, but several plans compete towards profitability, not towards how to best serve the market, how to best serve members. Um, and so the basis for the proposal was to respond to substantial concerns raised by providers and advocates, especially in behavioral health, regarding the MCOs uh, and whether they're sufficiently aligned with market needs. Um, HARP has been a very good example of this, right? Have MCOs done enough to improve outcomes like psychiatric readmission? Have they been good enough at paying the right amount to behavioral health providers as required by state law? Um, we think, two, it will achieve efficiencies and greater competition on volume for selected MCOs. Um, there are uh, an abundance of plans um, and plan types in certain aspects of the market. Um, as a result, um, plans are looking for, you know, it, it's very hard for plans to compete on volume. And we fund their administrative and operational overhead nine, 10, 11 times sometimes in a market. That is inefficient. It creates a, um, a demand for administrative talent. Uh, and at the same time, you know, MCOs can grow on volume and membership is the nature by which MCOs succeed in any market. Um, other states that have 
done effective procurements often require plans to describe their community reinvestment strategy. Uh, and community reinvestment could be MCOs that are, that are granting money towards community-based organizations and social terms of health, literally investing in creating provider access where none exists or where there is not sufficient access to deliver on member needs. Um, it's a way to have MCOs literally put money down on how they will improve the market that they're committed to. And without a procurement, we can't require and have plans compete on a community reinvestment strategy. Really important um, and, and, and currently a lost opportunity. Um, the other is, you know, we can ask plans and have them compete on how much they're gonna support ongoing Medicaid initiatives. Those can be things like value-based payment, investments in social terms of health, dual's integration. Moreover, as we move into a different CMS structure, um, this concept of directed payment, which many of you have probably heard um, in various, um, you know, various iterations, including how we intend to support the HCCs um, through the American Rescue Plan Act um, spending plan. Um, directed payments are essentially a way that a state can require a health plan to pay a certain amount to specific entities for specific purposes, whether VBP, whether you know, minimum rate schedules or rate add-ons. Um, and so as we rely on plans to effectuate directed payments, having fewer plans to work with and to flow the money through is an ideal part of that initiative. Um, and we also want to incentivize plans, lastly, from providing the most comprehensive offering, um, as well as both in terms of programmatic needs or an individual's needs or their changing income. Um, to us, it is unfortunate when a member has to leave a plan that they're happy with because they may have a HARP need and they're in the mainstream and that mainstream does not have a HARP in the county in which they live. Or if their income changes, so they're eligible now for the essential plan and they have to change plans because the Medicaid managed care plan doesn't offer essential plan or CHIP or QHP in that region. So how do we create more geographic expansion? Um, we only have one statewide plan, right? How do we encourage plans to go statewide and to, to have the greatest number of offerings so that if a member is satisfied with that plan, they never have to leave that plan. They're just changing products um, within that plan type. Um, we, in building the statutory design for the procurement, um, we have built in factors that we think are important to providing the right number of plans to serve the region. Um, accessibility and geographic distribution of network providers. The network matters. Who is in your network? We want to encourage providers to have the most expansive network and keep their providers happy. Um, on the facility side, that means public hospitals or safety nets. We want to make sure there are cultural and language competencies that we're giving a priority for homegrown not-for-profit plans as opposed to plans that are national publicly traded companies. Um, we want to have plans offer, um, uh, offer multiple products in multiple regions. Um, we want plans to be able to offer plan integration, um, especially for duals. And I'll talk about our dual strategy in, in this slide. Um, we want them to be committed to VVP and VVP with behavioral health at the center. Um, we want commitments to participate in quality improvement and community reinvestment past performance, so whether they have state, um, statements of deficiency, whether they've been sanctioned or fined, that will factor into it. So if a plan has performed poorly, this is a way to make sure that we don't keep rewarding them for that. Um, and then we've committed because, you know, and, and the HARP rollout has been instructive, we want to make sure that in the design of the procurement, we're considering factors that OMH really says OPWDD to the extent that population needs to manage care and OCFS are are, are at the table, um, both from a program design and a plan evaluation standpoint. Um, so what's the timeline um, if this gets enacted? Um, we are currently um, negotiating um, the Part P procurement um, as, it, as anticipated, um, you know, there's, there's you know, significant sectors of opposition. Um, there are concerns about member transition, network access, um, individual choice. Um, we think for the reasons we mentioned, we have very good reasons and rationales for doing this, but like everything with the budget, there's a negotiation. Um, to the extent that it gets enacted in the budget, um, we'll work from April to about September 
um, with our agency partners, OMH, OASIS, OPWDD, OCFS, and others to develop the RFP standards uh, and release the RFP for review. Um, and then from September of this year through October of next year, uh, MCOs will complete the RFP, we'll get Q&As, we'll score the responses, we'll issue the awards, and we'll go through the, process, the, the debriefing and process process, people hopefully having executed plan contracts by the next, you know, by the middle of the next rating period with an appropriate tra transition process for, you know, to the extent there are planned departures from the market as a result of the RFP. The, we don't expect under the terms of an RFP that there be a material reduction in mainstream plans. Um, we have two to five per region as the target in the procurement. Um, uh, the, the most mainstream plans we have in any one region is in New York City with seven. So we don't expect significant disruption or change within the mainstream product line, um, but we do expect a reduction in HARPs. Um, and we think that's a good thing. We think there are plans that are offering HARPs that probably shouldn't be. Um, and we do expect a reduction in managed long-term care, which we have 26 statewide, uh, including I think 14 downstate. Um, and that, um, you know, there's an acknowledgement, I think collectively that there are MLTCs that while they're working to consolidate, there's still an overabundance of choice um, for, for members in that region. So in addition to the managed care procurement, uh, I did want to do a, a, a slight plug because there is a time to be a health here in terms of our efforts at dual integration. One critical reason um, that we're doing the procurement in addition to trying to recenter behavioral health is to ensure that we are able to keep members who become dual eligible that Asian to Medicare uh, or become blind or disabled uh, to remain in a plan that offers a fully integrated benefit. Um, we, the, after the uh, collapse of FIDA, um, we haven't had a dedicated dual product that we could default enroll people into. Um, and so we've been working hard since for the last two years to try and create a roadmap. And this is my little cool graphic of a road um, of trying to ensure that people are moving effectively into dual products where, when they want to, um, and to avoid uh, default rules that create fragmentation between fever service and managed care. And so we have a six part strategy lined down the slides and we're publishing this roadmap on our website so people know where we're going. But critically, um, one element here, and it's part of this late 2022, early 2023 on the right hand side of the screen is to ensure that um, when we move people into Medicaid Advantage Plus, which is our fully integrated benefit product that has a long-term support and services component to it, that that component also includes behavioral health. So, it, so an individual can get their health care, their behavioral health, and their long-term supports and services all within a single plan. We're intending to launch that on 1-123 um, and to achieve plan readiness reviews and understanding whether plans are going to want to add that benefit into their MAP product to create a fully integrated, fully inclusive long-term care la um, landing point for individuals is, is something that we're achieving uh, for, for the, the, the dual community. So that's, that's where we're going now. And then the final puzzle piece, which is the longest term puzzle piece is our 1115 waiver concept paper. Again, many of us have discussed this over the last you know, 10 or 11 months. We've been doing a lot of planning, but more than planning, we've been doing a lot of listening. Um, you know, one of the criticisms that I recognize having spent so much time in the private sector is um, the process of waiver development has been somewhat opaque, right? It sort of comes out and you're like, oh, that's disruptive, that's really interesting. So we have, you know, we've shared our thinking. We've heard from so many of you. Um, we put out a concept paper even before we put out a waiver application. We want people to understand where we're going. We want to make sure that CMS likes where we're going. Um, and then before we submit the application, we want to be sure it's really addressing what we think needs to be addressed in the delivery system. And so for those of you who haven't spent considerable time with the concept paper, just to highlight a few critical elements here, um, but that we're seeking a five-year, $17 billion program as a, as a successor to DISRIP. Um, the idea and the central theme of the waiver is that we want to address the inextricably linked health disparities and systemic healthcare delivery system issues that were highlighted and intensified by the COVID-19 pandemic. In short, COVID revealed that we've done, that we could do a better job, not that we haven't tried, but we could do a better job at addressing health disparities 
and those individuals with health disparities had the most adverse COVID-19 outcomes. And so by really using this opportunity to invest significantly with new federal dollars and new programs to address those health disparities, especially for populations that have longstanding healthcare issues, whether it's SMI or SUD, whether it's social determinants of health needs and to design better social care intervention, that's what this money is going for. We want to build on the long-term momentum of value-based payment, which is why reissuance of the roadmap is so important. Um, we want to make sure we can build back better from the pandemic, um, thinking through larger federal goals and objectives there. And critically, we want to learn from the district experience. Um, and that includes the, over, the overemphasis on primary care-driven total cost of care, BDP, to something that is more population-specific and population-tailored. Um, it's a recognition that we need more direct investments in CDOs and social terms of health. We want to create administrative simplification by avoiding funding intermediaries that don't have a long-term objective within the healthcare system. And we want to make sure that MCOs are at the table, which is why the procurement becomes so important, because we want to make sure that there's, there's a weaving of normal plan premium with new waiver funding and a full integration and alignment of funding incentives to really address the needs of high-risk populations. Doing that in these slides, again, many of you have seen, we would create a regional planning structure called Health Equity Regional Organizations. These are not funding entities, but these are planning entities. These are to put all the stakeholders within a defined region. Um, it could be the Bronx, it could be Southwest Brooklyn. Um, you know, the, the, the regions could be small or large, but um, the population in the region should share health disparity characteristics. And the hero will be designed to inventory existing interventions that do a good job at addressing health disparities, programs like Pathway Home, um, as well as identify new potential collaborations between MCOs, healthcare providers, behavioral health providers, and CBOs to address unmet needs within that region. Um, the second component would be to provide direct investment in CBOs through what we're calling social terms of health networks. These are closed loop referral systems of CBO services within a defined region. So MCOs and providers can have a single point of contact to address the SDH needs of individuals. Um, there may be more than one, um, but the idea is that we would make infrastructure investments in, into CBOs so that they have the data wherewithal, they have the analytical capacity, they have the ability to have a network. Um, it's kind of like a BHCC for CBOs. And a BHCC could probably become an SDHN quite easily, um, depending on the inclusion of CDO services. And it's hard because there's a recognition that organizations don't perform a singular function, right? Um, you know, you know, services to the industry, for example, is a lot of things, more than just a mental health provider or an IDV provider, but also a housing services provider. Um, and so there could be a lot of different overlap with networks, but Really, the goal here is to ensure that there's infrastructure investment for CDOs to become HIPAA compliant when necessary, to create data exchange and interoperability so social care and healthcare data can flow together um, through a single health system, and that there's a workforce that is developed appropriately to address the needs of the members that have CDO conditions. And then we get to really the core element of the waiver design, which is advanced BBP models. Um, I've now said it a few times, but this is really moving beyond total cost of care, primary care driven BBP into arrangements that really target the needs of discrete population subsets with historical health disparities. Those can, and those can be episodic, like individuals leaving a psychi psychiatric admission. Uh, it could be um, more, you know, it could be condition specific, like individuals experiencing street homelessness. It could be the fact that individuals like children in foster care um, are part of a system that requires more health care, behavioral health, and social care intervention together. And that we would provide waiver funding through the plans on top of plan premium when they enter into VBP arrangements, ideally in a lot of cases with behavioral health providers at the central focus. And it could not just be behavioral health providers, but it could be providers that cross systems, whether OCFS and OMH or, or OPWDD, um, and that the funding would go towards three things, right? The three-legged stool. The first is enhanced care management and intervention. So how do we ensure that there's warm handoff that individuals are receiving that level of intensive care management through health home or otherwise that, that the current rate structure does not support? The second leg of the stool would be 
providing enhanced reimbursement and fee schedules, not just for healthcare providers, but to the extent that existing Medicaid fees or what's paid through plans aren't sufficient to fund the time and attention necessary, that we can provide additional reimbursement on top of that. And the third is full incorporation of CBO services. And that's not what we've done currently, where CBOs are eligible for shared savings as part of a level two or level three arrangement, but really to develop a CBO fee schedule for the interventions that they perform so that they can be effectively incorporated and, and an equal participant in these arrangements, because in many cases, the social care interventions are more important than the healthcare ones. Um, and so by providing this additional funding, which would be um, budget specific for the population presented to DOH as the arbiter of the arrangement between MCOs and, and providers, as we do today under the roadmap, we can release this additional funding to, you know, to really, you know, make sure those interventions are supported um, and are achieving the necessary outcomes as measured through, through those BGP arrangements. We are testing these types of initiatives already. For example, CBC has been part of an initiative pioneered by New York City Health and Hospitals around the street and shelter-based homeless um, to ensure that those CBO services, this pathway home, are incorporated within a larger design. We're doing that through a different authority called directed payment, um, and, but it's really a down payment on what we're thinking about that we could scale statewide and much bigger through the waiver itself. Um, we have a few other investments um, in this component, including training capacity for um, community health workers, for care navigators, for peer support workers that we think are essential to the success of these arrangements, uh, as well as to create career pathways, apprenticeship programs, really address some of the workforce challenges that we're, that we're all in, uh, encountering right now. And we would expand access and allow for health homes to start uh, engaging with incarcerated individuals 30 days prior to release so that those individuals are in care management and they can be put into care as soon as they're released. Um, and it's a reflection of criminal justice of all populations being a really good um, you know, population subset for effective DVP as we've, as we've thought through here. Um, and so with that, you know, that's the long-term vision. Um, there's like, like everything else in New York State uh, and in Medicaid, which um, is part of the FY23 budget, it's now grown to $93 billion. Um, and that's not even inclusive of all the mental, mental health and, and behavioral health spend. Um, it's, it's hard to move mountains, but we think through effective and incremental reform that tackles each of the different challenges, whether it's clearly conveying expectations, whether ensuring that we have the right partners and managed care plans, and three, whether we have the right funding and federal support through the waiver. We think we can really move the needle on ensuring the effective integration of behavioral health into physical health to address the holistic needs of individuals in the Medicaid program. So with that, I will stop. Um, and uh, I just want to end by thanking you for all that you do. Uh, it's easy for us to plan and think through the complexity of this, but it's really hard to do the work. Um, and so acknowledging that you and your organizations have been doing the work and creating an entity as robust and brilliant as CBC over the last 10 years, while you all have day jobs, is a remarkable testament to your commitment to the individuals we all serve. So thank you. Um, thanks, Brett. That was that was amazing. I, I find it so incredibly refreshing to hear, you know, someone talk about the issues that we deal with on a day to day basis, whether it's issues related to the plans or how things are financed and some of the challenges that we face day in and day out, considering that we provide, I think, in the public sector, a, a, a sort of a, a significant social good uh, as far as working with these really um, hard to engage, hard to reach, um, disenfranchised populations. Um, so thank you for all that. I think the 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 vision is transformational. Um, it's it's super exciting. Um, I think CBC and our network of providers are really positioned strongly to um, be able to take advantage of a lot of what's coming down the pike. And again, with your leadership up there, I think that you know we're really in good hands in terms of our ability to be able to continue to push the envelope and, and transform um, care as as, um, as as needed in New York State. So thank you for all all your advocacy. I am um, again amazing. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to segue quickly into a um, a little video um, that we put together before we jump into our first panel. Again, thanks, Brett, and um, cue the video. 
CPC is in a very strong position today and will continue to grow and expand its capabilities to really be at the forefront of all of the changes that are that are happening, whether it's having an aggregator role where we're looking at large scale grants that can support you know, many of our agencies across the different communities or being at the table when it comes to looking at how healthcare financing needs to change or will change. Are, are I think critical and, and CBC's strength as a health home, but also as an IPA with lots of innovative programs under its belt is primed to have a prominent seat at the table. We are a go-to when it comes to a lot of these initiatives. And I think that the, the, the capabilities that we have been able to build out in collaboration with many of our providers really puts us um, in the driver's seat on a, on a number of, of hopeful um, opportunities that will be uh, materializing in the next few years. I can't imagine the priorities of the behavioral health field being too much different because needs don't go away, needs don't change, mental health needs don't change. On the other hand, we have all the time new ways of dealing with things and new ways of, you know, working with people and so forth. But for the most part, it's about dealing with people who have serious needs. I see challenges, but I also see opportunities. CBC has always risen to the challenge. Um, and I see the opportunity of how it can leverage lessons learned in other states, those who've partnered differently for um, their um, local and, and state government, as well as partnering with our payers differently. We can solve that issue by better community care, by care management, by, um, by supportive housing, uh, community support programs. We have all the tools at this, in the CBC network to fix that. CBC is also going through transition as, you know, George leaves, but I, I you know, I think that George has develop this magnificent structure and establish a great culture at CBC, whereby I think we are going to enter into some interesting um, managed care contracts that are going to begin to perhaps look at stuff and, and things that might not just be uh, healthcare driven, but might be a little more behavioral healthcare driven. CBC is well positioned to support the organization and the people it serves. It understands the value of data to inform clinical decisions, to support additional funding, and to inform how funding is cascaded to network providers. I see CBC as a hub for services that are not even developed yet, and I think the best is yet to come. You know, if New York is going to turn around, it's not just Broadway, it's not just the hotels, it's the human beings that make up our city. And CBC IPA is really well positioned to do that because we're in every community. I feel very, very confident um, that CBC is in a strong position and, and it really will be able to deliver on a number of exciting new um, initiatives and opportunities um, in the years ahead. So thank you for this opportunity and I look forward to continuing to work with everyone um, as we proceed down this road. So I, I think, I don't, I, I don't know, I'm very excited about CBC's future. I think Donna and George, George's team and Trish, and you know, I really helped, helped set T this up to be wildly successful and it will be. Wow, kudos to the CBC team. That was amazing to watch. I've just been part of the organization for the last year and a half, but it's been an amazing thing to be a part of and happy 10 years. So good morning, everyone. I'm Bianca Wen, Medical Director here at CBC. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the first of two panels today. So for the next 45 minutes or so, we're gonna dive into the topic, when pandemic and epidemic collide, the opioid crisis in 2022 and beyond. Um, this panel is really version 2.0. If you were with us uh, back in 2020, we actually had this panel as one in a series of events as part of our innovations conference back in October of 2020, just seven months into the pandemic. And um, the moderator for that panel is Dr. Carol Ann Slattery, who's one of our panelists today. She kicked off that panel by asking our panelists um, to give 
one word, a single word that encapsulates the pandemic's impact on the opioid crisis, and three words were given, upheaval, resilience, and innovation. So in my mind, I think today's panel really serves as an inflection point nearly a year and a half later after we all got together and had the discussion then. And I think that this is a time for us to really take stock of where we're at and where we're going. One note that I wanna make before we pick things off, just as a reminder to everyone, the people that we have on this call, we have over hundred participants logged into our Zoom webinar. Um, this audience is made up of our colleagues. We have administrators, providers, peers, care managers, and so I'm really hoping that this can be an active dialogue amongst all of us in determining the way forward with substance use treatment. So please uh, make this as interactive as you'd like. If you have questions as we're moving through, please don't hesitate to throw them into the chat um, and I'll be sure to get to them um, throughout and then at the end as well. So without further ado, I'd like to bring on our three panelists, Dr. Kelly Ramsey, Dr. Carol Ann Slattery, and Kay Lindsay. All right, hi everyone. Great, so um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. And to kick us off, why don't each of you just briefly introduce yourselves? I'll start off with Dr. Ramsey. Hi everyone, good morning, thanks for coming. I'm Kelly Ramsey and I'm an internal medicine and addiction medicine physician. And I currently am the chief medical officer at New York City Oasis. Excellent, thanks. Dr. Slattery. Morning all, I am Dr. Slattery. I am the Vice President of um, Outpatient Services for Samaritan Daytop Village. Great, great to have you. And Kaylin. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kaylin C. I'm the Senior Director of Programs for the Washington Heights Corner Project and the New York Harm Reduction Educators in New York City. Awesome. So I think we've got a great panel put together. I just wanted to take a step back before we start. You know, last week's theme for CBC's 10 year anniversary was looking back. So just taking that at a bit more of a personal level, I'm really curious about the paths that brought you to the work that you're doing now in substance use treatment. Uh, so starting with you, Dr. Slattery, can you share a bit with us about how you originally came to this work? And looking back since you started, I'm wondering, in what ways might your work mindset and approach have changed over the years? That's actually a great question. I um, came in through working with the at-risk youth. I worked for many years at a really large school district in upstate New York, and I worked with adolescents who were struggling with a family dynamic and were self-medicating. Mm. Um, so I uh, saw that there was a huge need within the school system and in the court system for interventions and advocacy. And I ended up at uh, Daytop Village before it merged with Samaritan Daytop Village. So it's come full circle because now we have adolescents that we work with and adults within the agency and it's pretty amazing. I'm Anyone who knows me, I'm still advocating. So um, I see a need for change and we are evolving um, with new and innovative grants and stuff that are coming through through the state. So it's exciting. What I see um, in the future, is that what you're looking or? Just, I guess I'm wondering, comparing your work to back then, in what ways might your work have changed your mindset or approach? I feel like we've just learned so much about substance use and it's evolving all the time. Well, I think when I first came on, everything was siloed. And now mm -hmm. um, there, there wasn't um, a lot of evidence-based practice being utilized. Now you have evidence-based practice and integration um, being spoken about. I think how the state is looking for integration services and looking for those models to come through. And you can see that through the grants, which we're going to talk about today, um, is an absolute wonderful change. And I see it pushing forward, you know, and better things happening. Okay, excellent. And we'll dive into that. And, you know, in the time that I've known you, I didn't know that you started out with at risk youth. So I always think it's nice to hear people's origin story. Uh, Kaylin, how about you? How did you come to this work? Um, I started out as one of Dr. Slatterly's at-risk youth. <laughs> and um, uh, way a long, long, long time ago, I'm a dual citizen born and raised in Canada. Um, mm -hmm. And through that work, um, uh, or sorry, through my own experience and uh, sort of butting up against uh, the limitations of the system in Canada, 
I found my way uh, into a career in this field in Vancouver, Canada, uh, working in many of the harm reduction programs there, including at the first safe consumption site in North America at Insight. Um, and that was that was a long time ago. So I spent 10 uh, ish, 12 ish years working in Vancouver uh, in harm reduction in program innovation and development before uh, accepting a job in New York in 2016 and coming here to 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 attempt to sort of bring some of that to, to the US and and advance some harm reduction programming here. I've been doing that ever since. Excellent. Yeah, it seems like many years dedicated to this. Um, so thank you for the work that you're doing. And Dr. Ramsey, you can round us out. So I first became interested in, in substance and really more people who use drugs in the, in the early 90s. So I volunteered at a, at a needle exchange in Santa Cruz, California. I was also working at a community health center at the time and doing HIV counseling. And we knew very little about hep C. It was still non-hep A, non-hep non B at that time, but I was really interested in that as well. And then ended up doing the volunteer at the needle exchange and then realized I needed to probably go to medical school to reach the populations I wanted to reach to be able to do the type of work I wanted to do. And so ended up, I've spent my entire career doing um, substance use disorder treatment as well as hep C and HIV treatment primarily in, in underserved communities, both, both in urban and non-urban settings. And, um, and I, think, I think that that's really, I mean, I could go on and on, but that's probably all that's relevant for the conversation here. Okay, thanks. So what I'm hearing from each of you is that you really started out on the ground and now you're also in administrative positions. And I think that to do the work that we do, you have to really straddle both, um, keeping your feet on the ground and envisioning what's coming forward, which is what we'll dive into today. Um, so like I said at the start of the panel, this is really our version 2.0. Um, we met last time seven months into the pandemic when Dr. Slattery moderated the discussion in October. And we know that hindsight is 2020. Uh, we know that in that year, um, the number of deaths reached 2000 in New York City uh, from overdose deaths, the highest number since recording began in the year 2000. And so Dr. Ramsey, starting with you, I'm curious, just in the spirit of learning, I'm curious what you, would say about what you think we got right during that time based on what we knew and if there was anything else that you wished we had known or done or implemented. So I think certain things were done right in the context of the pandemic, for example, decreasing um, threshold for care engagement. So in other words, making sure that for example, take home uh, doses were extended for methadone to make it easier for people not only to engage with methadone, to, but, but to stay engaged and retain in care during the pandemic. Also eliminating the initial visit for buprenorphine, those things really helped. I think there was a little confusion very, very early in the pandemic about what uh, was considered essential providers. So for instance, I think that um, harm reduction initially, harm reduction services often got disrupted very early in the pandemic because it wasn't clear that they were an essential service, even though they clearly were, and because of problems with PPE being available and keeping people safe. So, you know, in hindsight, we would have had better um, better infrastructure in place for disruptions in care. I think we will have better infrastructure in place next time, making sure that PPE is available in case of a future similar or different pan type of pandemic, but also being super aggressive early on about overdose prevention in, in all communities of people who are using drugs. Because I think traditionally in the substance use disorder treatment world, people only think about overdose with respect to people who are knowingly using opioids. And I think that, that left uh, many populations really vulnerable during the pandemic. Absolutely. And I'm curious, Kaylin, hearing Dr. Ramsey talk about that with harm reduction providers maybe being left out, not considered as essential workers. What was your experience like during that time? It was, it, I, I really appreciate Dr. Ramsey's framing of this and um, it, it was really challenging. It felt a little bit like we were in the background waving our arms around, um, you know, saying, uh, I, I think it's really short-sighted short to count us out of the response. What, what I will say is, is I think we were heard, to be honest. Um, I think, you know, as a city, as a country, 
uh, as a community, a care community, we were all blindsided by the severity um, and the sort of rapidity of the onset of the pandemic in New York City. Harm reduction service providers pride themselves on kind of being ready for anything, right? We're adaptable, we offer services anywhere, um, you know, inclement weather, you name it. We were not ready for this. Um, so I'm in some ways actually quite grateful to the pandemic because it was a it was a it was a huge wake up call um, uh, programmatically uh, around preparedness uh, and just really understanding the depths to which this this kind of disruption um, could impact our ability to take care of people. Um, now, you know, pandemic 2.0 or 3.0 or whatever is coming for us in the future, I think we're much better positioned uh, to not have to close. We can do a various kinds of pivots, whether it's to telehealth or blah, blah. We have so many more options now, just as a care community, um, that will never really be blindsided the way we were before. And I think to Dr. Ramsey's point, uh, it became very clear early on in the pandemic uh, how essential the harm reduction service providers were going to be to reaching this population that was by and large very off the radar, very like marginalized to a degree that marginalization doesn't even really cover. Um, you know, so we don't expect to be counted out in future pandemics. Got it, thank you. And Dr. Slattery, I'm wondering if you have anything to add to that. I know that um, you spoke a lot about telehealth and the changes that we pivoted to last year. Now looking back, what do you think? So I have two points on that. Yes, I think um, how we had thresholds that were lifted and also um, regulations that were, you know, allowed us the capability to see clients through telehealth in the community and not have to worry about, um, you know, having a face-to-face -face first. So I think that was a huge thing. I think under um, the billing and the APGs in regards to time, because a lot of telephonic was being used, um, allowed the agencies to still keep engagement and retention with clients, which was amazing. Um, however, there is a downside to all of that. When programs closed, and when I say closed, meaning closed their doors on site, that maybe went strictly telehealth, I think we're now just recently seeing the consequences to that a year later, meaning mm -hmm. we had a lot of individuals that probably were not good candidates at that moment for the telehealth services and now trying to re-engage back in, and a lot of missed opportunities of nonverbal stuff that's going on through telehealth. So I think training um, needs to be expanded, obviously, we were running through a crisis, so we were, re we were making sure that we were pushing through that crisis. However, now I think we need to regroup and look at a whole, um, the different types of populations that we're servicing, how we're gonna service them appropriately if they don't have the video capability and they're using the telephonics. Um, and also, are they a candidate? You know, now that we're keeping, you have a lot of organizations that went through telehealth, you know, and with staffing shortages, they're able to accommodate and, and to change budget models and stuff. But um, we still have individuals that maybe don't meet that meet the criteria of that model. So two point have to do the positive and the negative, right? Strength based and obvious. Yeah, I definitely I think I think that you raised some really great points because we're having a lot of discussion about shifting the telehealth, but I haven't really heard that issue raised of how do we transition back and how do we also maintain a person centered approach to that, recognizing that you know, we made kind of a blanket approach to everyone shifting to video, but really it doesn't serve everyone. And how do we have that discussion when now a lot of clients are more reluctant to come in and for a really good reason, um, but how do we make sure that we keep them safe? So I, I definitely agree with that. Anything else from Dr. Ramsey or Kaylin? Just say that the, the pandemic, the pandemic challenged us to look at some of our restrictions in service and why they were restrictions. So the pandemic really challenged us to say, why is the answer no to this? And does it have to be? Um, thus resulting in um, a, a broader portfolio of options to people, which is what you're what you're talking about now. Um, and I think I think the sweet spot, so to speak, as we look to the future and address some of the concerns that Dr. Slatterly brought up, brought up is, of course, continuing to offer those options and find what's right for each individual person, each individual program setting and set of circumstances. Um, but again, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying, I really wish that COVID hasn't happened and that it didn't continue to happen, but it really did uh, result in, in all of us necessarily having to 
uh, look at the structures and the strictures that we put in place to these services and to reassess um, whether they're actually upholding our ultimate aim, which is to allow people to access care. Absolutely. Okay. Dr. Ramsey? I don't really have, Kaylin covered the points that I was going to cover. I just think OASIS has clearly emphasized to programs, you need to be ready to go either way, telehealth, not telehealth, depending on the individual patients, which shouldn't be either or, it should be what works well to keep that patient engaged in care. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, we've talked a little bit about the past, your personal past, and then looking back over the last two years in the pandemic. And so I would love to catch us up to speed now. It's been a very busy couple of months for each of you. So I'm wondering, um, Kaylin, we'll start off with you. If you can just give us a snapshot of, of where you're at with On Point NYC. Uh, we're just so grateful to have you here on the panel and um, just share with our providers what you guys have been up to and what it's been like. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so I'm sure everybody knows that On Point NYC uh, opened the first two sanctioned overdose prevention sites in the United States on November 30th, um, one in Washington Heights and one in Harlem. Um, operations are going really well. I'll share a little bit of the early data uh, at a point in the conversation when it makes sense. Um, but just to give sort of a line or two on how we made this happen, um, we do not have federal permission and we don't officially have state permission. We do have a letter um, from a former mayor uh, sort of throwing his support behind the initiative uh, and protecting us from prosecution from various city uh, departments, city, city agencies, uh, and that would be former Mayor de Blasio. De Blasio is not in power anymore. We have Adams in power. Um, and we're fairly confident, well, we know, we are confident that the Adams administration is gonna to continue to support the overdose prevention centers. Um, I just sort of make that point. I, I sort of just drop that there for us to look at because really we were able to do this thing that no one thought was ever gonna happen in the US um, and do it very successfully, be public about it, land this intervention in the public sphere for scrutiny and discourse and debate, really change minds uh, in various sectors where people would have uh, not thought that would be possible. And they're still open. And the federal government hasn't come. And the state government is trying to figure out how to support. And just to make clear again, all we have is a letter from a mayor who is no longer in power. So I love that as an example of we have to stop saying we can't do that. We have to stop saying that'll never happen here um, because these two sites are, are proof positive that that, that, that isn't true, um, especially as relates to the, to the overdose and uh, drug, toxic drug supply um, epidemic. Beyond that, at On Point NYC, we're really honored and uh, thrilled to announce that we've been funded to go 24 hours at both our program locations. So not only do we have the first two overdose prevention centers in the country, we're about to have the first two 24-hour uh, overdose prevention centers. This is really rare in the safe consumption story globally. Very few uh, safe consumption sites in other parts of the world are operating 24 hours. So this is going to be, this is real trailbla trailblazing for the United States. Um, and uh, I, I think will be really impactful for the experience of people um, that we work with in Harlem and Washington Heights. We are also developing the first ever harm reduction mental health units as a part of that expansion. So going to some of that siloing that Dr. Slatterly was referring to earlier, we plan to sort of obliterate that silo completely um, by visioning something very different um, uh, for addressing mental health for people who are experiencing concurrent disorders uh, and continuing to use. So really looking at this idea that uh, you can't access mental health care while you're under the influence of uh, illicit or other um, drug products. Um, we are looking at launching uh, mobile consumption um, as another model, and we're exploring virtual safe consumption. Uh, of course, an acknowledgement that still today, the vast majority of overdose fatalities are incur occurring in housing settings behind closed doors where people are alone. So how do we reach them? How do we address that? So again, looking at innovation, if public housing is not going to let harm reduction in, uh, in, in the more traditional sense, how else can we get in there to protect people? Uh, so th these are some of the innovations that we're looking at going ahead. 
Last thing I'll mention is integrating, of course, psychedelic therapy into our mental health platform, uh, ketamine treatment, uh, psilocybin, um, all these other uh, sort of, you know, established and uh, increasingly studied uh, interventions in the U.S. that have, have really proven quite successful in other jurisdictions that we're interested in bringing to the United States in a formal way for access by our population, not sort of kind of along that, these things tend to be quite elitist and, and bringing those uh, to, to the populations who uh, previously could never have afforded or engaged with these kinds of uh, care options. I think I'll leave it there. Wow, that's a lot. Um, that's amazing work that you've done just in the last couple of months. And I'm curious just because for members of the audience and for myself as well, you know, I don't have much familiarity with how overdose prevention centers work or are set up. Can you tell us just a little bit about who's on your team? What type of people are you working with to make all these types of decisions? I'm just curious who's at the table. Absolutely. So this is, um, I, I think probably some people on the call know that the Washington Heights Corner Project and the New York Harm Reduction Educators were operating unsanctioned programs for six years before we opened the sanctioned program. Um, the, our funders at the city health department and the state health department knew uh, the New York Police Department in both of our neighborhoods also knew. Um, so this was, again, you know, harm reduction finds a way often. Uh, and we knew that people were using drugs in uh, public bathrooms all over New York City, all over the country, um, in parks, subway stations, public spaces, bank vestibules. We also knew that they were using in, in our bathrooms at our program sites. As a harm reduction service provider, we felt we had a moral obligation to make sure no one died in our program. And, and that was sort of the foundation, uh, the impetus for formalizing uh, uh, our, our sort of bathroom or hygiene services into an unsanctioned overdose prevention program. That program was very successful and very well used. It was uh, one of the most heavily used services that we offered. And over the years, uh, as, as everyone on this call knows, particularly in New York, New York State, there's been this real investment in figuring out how we could do this um, at, at various levels of government and in the public sector. Uh, the city health department and the state health department have been really integral partners for us in making this a reality and have been really lockstep in us in trying to find the moment. And very consistent in the safe consumption story in other parts of the world is a transition in power at a mayoral um, and gubernatorial level. And that's definitely what happened here. We had an outgoing mayor, we had a change uh, in leadership at a gubernatorial level, at a state level, um, and that was the window. We're very grateful that when the window prevent, presented itself, that the, in particular, the city health department and the mayor's office uh, said, let's do this. Let's throw everything we can behind this and make this happen. I do wanna make clear that that support does not extend to funding support. At this time, no city or state dollars are being used to fund the overdose prevention centers. Having said that, everyone in the country is, is, is sort of looking at our outcomes and how our operations are going um, from the perspective of, finding a way uh, to integrate this service into the public health lexicon at both the state and city level. Um, so this is really, this is really a decision at a, at a city level. And that's what it is. It's just a choice. It's a decision. What we've proven is that it is just a decision to say, we're going to do this and we're going to figure it out. Um, and then, and then lining up all of the other stakeholders as well. Police is a big stakeholder. Um, we relied heavily on uh, police contacts from other jurisdictions to help the NYPD conceive what this could look like for them. Police sometimes need to talk to police. We get that. Um, and we facilitated that and, uh, and helped and help those conversations uh, happen in the way that uh, in such a way that the NYPD felt comfortable and understood the way these programs could uphold public safety in the neighborhoods where they operate. And, and they do. So people arrive at our sites with their drugs. We don't provide drugs. Um, they come in, they do a very short registration. People can smoke, snort, uh, inject, swallow, drink, or otherwise ingest their drugs of choice. Visits to our sites are by dose. Um, there's no time limit in our sites. Um, and everyone on the team is trained to respond at the level of a registered nurse. Um, and thus really reducing our, our dependence on emergency services. So to date, we've been open for two months and three days. Uh, we responded to 125 overdoses 
we've only had to call 911 four times. That's a massive savings to the emergency services and uh, hospital system and a huge testament to the, to the ability uh, of, of the staff at both sites. We are comparing two different models. We have a consumer-led model up in Washington Heights where most of the folks working in the site are active in their own use. And then we have a more traditional medical model in East Harlem. Um, and, and that's the site, that's the model that I think most people are familiar with, the, the stainless steel booths and et cetera, et cetera, uh, supported by a nurse and a care coordinator on the team. That was strategic. We're evaluating the two models against each other with the intention of uh, sort of handing over a blueprint to the rest of the country, uh, demonstrating the scalability, both, both fiscally speaking and in terms of personnel. Uh, of both of these models, depending on the jurisdiction, uh, different models uh, will be um, easier to stand up because, of course, there are licensing requirements around doctors and nurses, etc., uh, that various jurisdictions may not want to grapple with. Thanks, Kaylin. I'm just struck by how much thought has gone into everything that you're doing, and not only are you offering really important work on the ground, but it takes a lot of effort to negotiate and manage all these partnerships and relationships that you were just mentioning. It does, um, and it requires a little bit of fake it till you make it, to be honest. It requires showing at the, up at the table with a plan um, and as a leader, even if you are sort of feel like you're, you've got ground to make up and harm reduction isn't often sitting at a table as a trusted leader. Um, but we decided that's who we had to be in this. We had to lead, we had to show the way. Um, because there wasn't a blueprint in the U.S. for how to do this. And we're grateful that um, space was made for us to do that. Absolutely. Thanks. So Dr. Slattery, you know, we were part of getting this um, huge, amazing grant, $10 million to CBC for CASN. And a lot of the work that you've been doing is very similar to the work that Kaylin and her team is doing in terms of negotiating partnerships and trying to get a bunch of people to work together on one initiative. Can you give us a snapshot of what CASN is first and foremost and, and what the work is looking like now? Sure, so um, CASN is, is known for Citywide Addiction Support Network. It is 21 providers that are working with, you know, the CPCIPA was part of that um, grant on a source to grant SAMHSA initiative that OASIS um, chose for the Bronx, um, for Manhattan and for Queens. This initiative, our group is looking at true integration and access to care. What is amazing, it has three parts. It has the prevention, the treatment and the recovery section of it. Um, the biggest overarching goals that I would love to express is in not just improving access to care, but going outside the four walls and being literally within the community. So it is very peer driven. There is a treatment and medication assisted um, section of that, but it's having these peer teams out in the community, like um, what Kaylin said, um, being where the client is. If they're involved in uh, use of any type of substance, alcohol, it's geared towards opiate use disorder and stimulant use disorder, getting them a warm handoff to wherever they need to go. So yes, they're involving in the ingestion of um, a substance or al alcohol, but what can we do to provide them for insight into the next step of a journey for recovery? So what we're doing is we expanded um, to all levels of the community. Our goal is to increase medication assisted treatment. That is the huge goal. We wanna make sure clients don't have to go into the clinics to get access, but the main focus was 24 seven. So because of this grant and being afforded the money, having the ability to be 24 seven with um, an open line of crisis, and then being able to partner with a pharmacy and also um, the agency. So once the client gets the medication, doing warm handoff to wherever they are in those boroughs to the next treatment provider. And that's where the network came in, um, the citywide addiction support network with the providers. The other thing is they wanted us to look at the community, two other areas, the criminal justice population for reentry and also LGBTQ, a population um, with the adolescents and young adults. And they wanted us to enhance substance use services to that population. So we have partnered with the criminal justice, Rikers Island, um, when working with prevention, obviously we're tapping into the families and the school systems, but also the community providers working with those special populations. 
and we are partnered with Health and Hospital. So um, Health and Hospital is um, working with uh, emergency department lead teams within the ERs um, and also with LGBTQ. The focus is to avoid the ER. So we don't want people going into the hospital. We want them to work with um, the agencies and the 24-7 the access for the treatment. The biggest thing is um, the low-income New Yorkers. So obviously because of this funding, you know, when someone's calling up in the middle of the night, we don't have to sit there and say, do you have insurance? And if you don't have insurance, A, we can't help you, or B, we might have to send you to the hospital. So we're able to um, give them the medication that they need and then wait till we can find a provider, um, you know, to, for like a bridge, you know, for the next type of services. The criminal the justice population was very important on the treatment team side and also the recovery side is because these are individuals that are you know have been in a very secluded environment for a period of time if they were um, incarcerated and when they're coming out there's a disconnect so that re-entry section um, and being able to partner with recovery and peers with a therapist and also to continue medication was a really big part um, of the second phase of what we're you know what we're uh, talking about so overall, the, the prevention, treatment, and recovery um, providers have literally gotten together. Um, we have meetings on a regular basis. It's been amazing, the 21 providers on the network to finally all talk and how mm -hmm. we can work together, integrate workflows, but also sharing of ideas. You know, every agency has a very unique niche and we're able to actually tap in and some providers might have not been engaging in medication assisted treatment. Um, they might have been doing the med management, but not the induction. So being able to have almost like that technical assistance within the providers and getting to know each other and work together, because we all hear about each other, but now we're talking, um, has been a really wonderful experience. That's so that's great. No, and the grant has extended to 2023. So um, right now we're looking at data. You know, obviously outcomes and the and the data measurements is where we want to look to see what we need to change, what we need to tweak or what we're doing and enhance better. I think what you raise is really important. It was somewhat of an unintended outcome, but one that was going to happen anyways in terms of having all these providers coming to the table and having a discussion together and really getting to know each other face to face. Um, and I just feel like, you know, one of my favorite things about CBC is actually the name, Coordinated Behavioral Care, which is so straightforward and simple. But I feel like CASN is the perfect model of that in coordinating treatment, prevention, and recovery. So thank you. Yes, and it's working with the borough. So we're all, it's not just in one borough, it's multiple. Yeah. It's rated. Absolutely. Dr. Ramsey, can you give us a snapshot of what's happening at Oasis and, and what you guys have been working on? Sure. I'm just going to focus in on a few things. Um, probably most people are aware that we have a new commissioner starting on December 1st. So Dr. Chinazo Cunningham, who um, is a wonderful physician and very harm reduction focused and has spent her entire career looking at low threshold and harm reduction models and, and being part of them in the Bronx. Um, so uh, we're very, very happy to have her. And um, I personally am very happy to have her. I've known her since 2004. She was my mentor in residency. So um, she has a very clear vision for OASIS and it's sort of three pronged. One prong is really um, concretizing the role of harm reduction across the entire continuum of care for substance use disorder services, including prevention, treatment, and recovery, and uh, creating a harm reduction division in within OASIS. Obviously, we already work very closely with the Office of Drug User Health and the Department of Health, but by putting a division of harm reduction in OASIS, it gives a clear, a very clear message that harm reduction is part of the care for substance use disorder treatment. Um, another piece is she is very um, data-driven and evidence-based, and so we are looking at our own ability as an agency to improve our data collection from our providers so that we can um, have better information and knowledge about our patient population and what we can do to improve care. And um, the other thing is that I think is important to her and to us is part of the data piece as well is looking at our system and really looking at and scrutinizing it with a health equity and a racial equity lens, what we're doing, what we could do differently and where we're failing in the system. And so I think that um, 
that that's what I'm going to focus on as far as revision, because those things are extraordinarily important and shining a light on areas that haven't had a light previously within the agency. Some things that are innovative that not necessarily are driven by OASIS, but OASIS is implementing them. And th these are pretty exciting things that have um, been made available by changes in federal like, regulations. So uh, mobile medication units, there's an RFP out for that currently. I think that's a really exciting option for New York State. What that means is that methadone can be delivered mobily in addition to buprenorphine. So for instance, in a rural area that does not have an OTP, uh, a mobile um, medication unit can be affiliated with an OTP, but travel at great distance to deliver uh, methadone and buprenorphine mobily. It also allows for initial methadone visits to be done on the mobile medication unit, which is the first time ever that you could do an initial methadone visit outside of the brick and mortar OTP. So that's a huge innovation. And not only, I don't envision it just for rural, um, poorly resourced populations, but also urban populations that, um, for example, unstably housed or um, street homeless persons who will never physically make it to the OTP. They may already be taking methadone on the street and doing well on it. So this gives them uh, an option for them actually to receive dosing that's appropriate for them. Um, so that's one of the great innovations. There's also RFP out for um, methadone delivery service. So we saw methadone delivery service in New York City during that, particularly during the height of the pandemic. It still exists on a very small scale, but that was uh, really innovative in freeing up again methadone delivery to people where they were. Uh, in, in the context of the pandemic, it was done for people who had COVID-19, were exposed to COVID-19, at high risk for COVID-19, also to de decrease the foot traffic in the OTP. But as it's envisioned, it would be across New York State, not just in New York City. And it, and it could be um, widened for delivery for other reasons, obviously, that are aside from pandemic-related uh, reasons. So those things that I that I think are exciting and going on. And um, we also put out a lot of resources around person centered care harm reduction, we've done a lot of webinars with providers, highlighting uh, providers within our own system who we think are really the models for specific models of care we're looking at, whether it's person-centered care, delivering um, hep C services, et cetera. So I think it's important that we showcase the providers that are doing it well within our system, rather than, than us being the ones telling them how to do it. So those are some of the things going on. Thanks. So you, um... You already kicked us off thinking about innovation and I'm watching the time and this, this panel has flown by. We have six minutes left about. And so I just wanna bring us up to speed to this week's theme, which is looking forward. And um, you know, I feel like each of you have identified some of the priorities for substance use treatment moving forward. That being um, location specific, thinking about innovative models of delivery being mobile. We're also thinking about immediacy of access. So thinking about 24 seven access and the importance of that. And then also highlighting of course, harm reduction, which has been there all along that I think now is garnering more support across the board. Um, so I'm curious just if you can give us a sense of any trends you think we should be watching out for as providers when it comes to patterns of substance use, um, for example, um, concurrent substances that might be used along with opioids that we need to be mindful of as providers, and then also trends that we might be seeing in prevention, um, treatment, and recovery. So I will throw this first to Kaylin. Um, trends. Um, youth, unfortunately. Um, we're seeing um, a lot of youth who are uh, touching down at our programs uh, as injectors. Uh, so we're not even seeing that progression or graduation to injection. Uh, they're arriving at our sites as injectors and very young teens. Um, and this is, this is something that, that, is, that is new and that we, we uh, have identified as, 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 as a trend that we are uh, really invested in addressing. Um, it's, it started, I would say around 2018, we started to see uh, considerably more young people. I'm not sure if that's uh, true for um, Dr. Ramsey and Dr. Slatterly. I imagine that it probably is. 
uh, to see this, this trend towards younger folks. Um, another trend that I see sort of evolving and percolating, which is really encouraging, is innovation in mental health as relates to substance use. Uh, the Be Heard program coming out of health and hospitals is really interesting. Mental health respite centers uh, that are sort of uh, looking to uh, create space for people who may in, uh, be experiencing uh, a mental health or drug-induced mental health uh, episode. All of that diversion from the hospital system, I think, is really interesting. And I also think uh, one of the trends that we're going to see is a real commitment to evolution uh, from all of us. So I think uh, one thing that we're, SAMHSA is putting their money where their mouth is with uh, Dr. Ramsey referenced this, their harm reduction uh, RFP that's currently out. I have a lot of criticisms of the structure of that RFP. 150 page budget is not harm reduction, <laughs> um, but it's there and it's real. Um, but we're going to start to see real meaningful partnerships between um, more abstinence-based programs and harm reduction programs. And I think what's going to come from that is going to be really interesting, really vital, really impactful, and really different. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm really excited uh, and encouraged by, um, by the potential of that union looking ahead. Great. I think we need all the enthusiasm and encouragement and excitement that we can get. So I'm glad that that's the note that you ended with. Uh, Dr. Ramsey, you mentioned already a couple of innovative models of service delivery, but what else do you have to add in terms of things we should be looking out for? So I agree with Kellen that, um, that increased mental health symptoms and substance use among youth and also LGBTQ plus populations and women are of concern. So that's something that we should be aware of. And we should also be tailoring program to meet people's needs because the one size fits all of treatment does not work for everyone. And so we really need to be culturally humble and think about how we're creating programming and how we can make it relevant to the people that we're, that we're trying to help and not think that they're not ready or they're not willing, we're, rather what are we doing or not doing in order to make our, our patients um, do well in our settings. Um, I think I agree with Kaylin too that I think that there's going to be more and more interface between sort of tradition, more traditional settings and harm reduction. I think that if, to me, the biggest success is if we can make harm reduction just part and parcel of all our programs and not see it as other. Um, everything we do is harm reduction. Everything that helps somebody move in the direction of positive change, whatever that change looks like, is, uh, is something that should be embraced. And, re and just remember that um, we, we have a lot that we can work on with people if they aren't interested in decreasing or stopping their, their substance use. There are many, many, many other goals that people have. And if we can help people be more functional in their lives in general or, um, or accomplish goals in their lives, that's really what we should be focusing on. Absolutely. And Dr. Slattery, anything to add to that? Sure. So I think um, agency wise, what I'm seeing is, you know, obviously in the last couple of years between bail reform, legalization of marijuana, COVID, um, there's been a, a little bit of a shift in regards to, yes, the adolescent and young adult population, I agree, has become um, more on the forefront of the problem behaviors, but also not just we were focusing on the opioid um, epidemic and we have a large amount of populations coming in with multiple situations happening with with the substance use alcohol cocaine uh, I will tell you cocaine and crack is definitely you know pushed through on admissions in regards to people that are struggling obviously you know as, as providers we struggle with the fentanyl and, and you know being a part of everything but I think as an agency because we have person-centered being talked about and the harm reduction and because of those other things I talked, you have to have buy-in through staff, right? So we need to look at, you know, incorporating certain processes within our agencies. We need to get um, people to understand and educate themselves what actually truly is person-centered and what does that mean? How does that look along with harm reduction? Um, you know, everyone was on that abstinence model for so long. So I think, you know, agencies need to educate um, I think 
Right now, if the agencies are not modifying their service deliveries and looking at access and retention in regards to who's coming in on the special populations with women, the young adults, LGBTQ, um, and, and looking at our agency infrastructure and the resources, because we can have these wonderful things coming from state and changing of regulations. However, if the agency and the infrastructure and the resources to drive the, the the in you know the information out there to the staff and we all as agencies are seeing you know retention of staff um, uh, depletion of medical and social workers coming in um, so the staffing is changed so i think you know right now there's so much happening at one time mm -hmm. it's almost like you need like your bucket of to-do list where to start first um, and look at uh, the needs but the clients and the the co-occurring disorders coming in from co from covid and also the substances has been um very problematic to work with you know what i mean being able to say you know how are we going to help this individual along with the harm reduction um, methodology the only the only thing i would just add are just some resources as carolyn mentioned you have to have resources so we released a, a harm reduction um training in a box which has four vignettes and it's for individuals not interested in changing their use, but what, what can you talk to them about? What are harm reduction messages that you can have with persons who are not interested in decreasing their use or stopping their use? So I was encouraged, we released that and 300 people registered the first day it was released. So that gives me hope um, that people do wanna learn this information and really do want a message better. And another thing is you can check on the OASIS website for Learning Thursday presentation and other training in a boxes, there are many, many, many related to these topics on the website. Thank you, Dr. Ramsey. So I'm noting the time and it's our time to bring this to a close and wrap up. But one thing I can say is that I feel incredibly reassured um, by the fact that we're all working together and we're not in this alone anymore. You had mentioned that we we're working in silos in the past and it really seems like we're trying to converge everything that we're doing. Um, and on top of that, I just want to thank all of you. You're doing such impressive work. And I feel like you've really forecasted what's to come. And I hope that we can have a part three to this panel maybe next year and, and see where we're at and invite you all back. So thank you so much for being here with us. We really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. I'm going to pass it off to George, who's going to be wrapping us up with our last event of the day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Bianca. That was uh, an amazing panel. Um, thank you, Kaylin, Kelly, and, and Carol. Uh, again, amazing. Um, I, I do want to like just pause and and remark on the fact that you know we we heard you know from Brett about all of the changes that are happening um, in Albany and coming down the pike and that are going to impact you know us as providers and ultimately uh, the, the the clients that we we serve um and there was a lot of talk about behavioral health and consumers in a very different way and and sitting here listening to this panel and you know with city and state uh, representatives i uh, i'm amazed at just the, the 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 change in the way that we're thinking and talking about um, substance use disorders. You know, we heard about evidence-based interventions, and we talked about innovations. We talked about harm reduction and, and mobile services. This is this is you know groundbreaking. It's transformative, and it's really aspirational for me in terms of you know where we were and where we're where we're at. I mean, I, I worked for many years in the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and I think this degree of of innovation and and um, um, thinking about different paradigms of care um, is is a first, and I'm. I'm incredibly excited about the opportunities ahead um, for us. So again, thank you all for, for that amazing um, discussion. I, I do want to pivot to this panel. This is about um, sort of leadership in, in times of uncertainty. Um, it's a little bit of a, of a slight pivot from where we were just talking about, but I think it definitely is very related. I wanted to um, you know, just start by thinking about, you know, two years ago plus, um, you know, global pandemic, a humanitarian crisis, a healthcare crisis of unprecedented proportions. None of us ever lived through anything like this. Uh, and we had to sort of adjust. Um, it's been two years of, I think, a lot of, um, a lot of living under this sort of, re, re, sort of recalibration of our reality and our normal. Um, and in the context of a lot of social upheavals across the board. Um, and I think really, uh, an, uh, an incredibly 
focused spotlight on what many of us in the field know are true in terms of the health disparities, but all of a sudden we saw it so glaringly and just manifested in terms of the COVID um, pandemic and, and the, the, the health um, inequities there. So, so in light of that, I mean, we wanted to um, really talk to some key leaders. I have worked with all of these folks. I'm going to, you know, have them come on and, and introduce themselves. But, you know, um, both, you know, Sherry um, Tucker from Well Life Network and Cal Hedigan from Community Access are on the CBC board. Uh, I've worked closely with them over the last four years, with Darren in the last couple of years in this new position at Greenwich House. Um, it's been an incredible collaboration. So I, I'd like you guys to join the panel. Um, here you go. Um, and um, maybe we could just sort of, you know, allow you all to introduce yourselves. Um, and then hopefully we'll be able to have a really robust conversation about what it means to be a leader in these really uncertain, but, you know, interesting times. Um, Sherry, why don't we start with you? Great. Thanks, George. Uh, my name is Sherry Tucker. I'm the CEO of Well Life Network. I'm excited to um, be here today and uh, look forward to the discussion. Darren? Uh, thanks, George. Uh, Darren Block. I'm the CEO and executive director here at Greenwich House. As George noted, I, I joined about two months before COVID turned our, all of our lives upside down. So uh, certainly uh, interesting times for all of us. But thanks for the invitation, George. Cal? And I'm Cal Hedigan, the CEO at Community Access. And I will round out the thanks for being asked to be part of this panel. Yeah, so again, thank you guys for joining. And I, like I said, I think you all come at this, you know, this panel, but in your positions from a very unique perspective. And that's why I thought it'd be really interesting to hear, hear from you. I, I wanted to start the conversation um, maybe starting at a personal level and maybe working our way up to more sort of the, the, the organizational leadership. You know, at CBC, we're mostly administrative, operational, back-end stuff. We don't do any direct services. But I have to say, as, you know, sort of the, the CEO at CBC, you know, trying to juggle what it meant for me as a, as a, as a person, as a parent, um, you know, COVID and everything happening um, was incredibly difficult, right? I had to juggle all of a sudden, you know, working from home, kids both, you know, both my kids, you know, um, at school remote, um, lockdown, quarantine, social distancing, thinking about the workforce, our, our workforce, and also thinking about what all that meant, you know, for our provider agencies. And it was, it was, it was stressful. It was a juggling act that I had a really hard time figuring out. I mean, we had multiple milestones in the course of our family life that were canceled. Um, so dealing with that personally, you know, also in my role as a, as a, as you know, sort of the, the CEO at, at CBC, you know, juggling that. So I guess my question to you all is, you know, how did you balance or manage the impact of all of this on yourselves, but then also, you know, in terms of your role as, as your, an executive at your agency, um, maybe Darren, I'll start with you on, on that. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just say uh, one of the things that jumped out of me, it's an old adage. I think everybody on this call probably uh, feels this or knows this, but uh, health uh, or help providers tend to be the worst help seekers. And so as an organization of help providers, constantly just reinforcing um, and, and validating what our teams were going through and giving them space and encouragement to truly um, you know, take advantage of EAPs, give themselves time and space, but really trying to prime and promote help seeking. So that was one. Uh, the, other the, the other two other things I really tried to reinforce, and I don't know that any of this is, is uh, probably terribly unique to a lot of the, the, our colleagues and peers on this call, but either to share it or to validate what folks are doing. I, I constantly reminded folks that, that we were, and still are to some degree, administering wartime medicine. And to give folks the comfort that um, that not not to be perfectionist at that, to understand that mistakes are going to happen as long as they're made with care and not carelessness, but as long as there's care and effort, mistakes are going to happen, and that's okay. Really encouraging folks to to give themselves a break through all of this. And then the last thing I'd, I'd say I, I really thought and reinforced and continue to do is reinforcing that this is not normal. And, and that this is, I don't even think that we're yet into the new normal. Um, and to get people comfortable with the evolutions and iterations and, and uh, of the time we're in, those were, kind of, those were kind of some of the themes that I really tried to drive. Thanks, Aaron. Cal, what about, what about you? I think 
One of my thoughts was it really um, helping me understand my own privilege um, in terms of the strains on my life. Um, so for example, I live in Manhattan. I'm a bicycle commuter. Going to work did not mean for me being on the subway. Um, I have a setup at home that allows me to work remotely um, if, if I needed to, which I didn't for the most part. But understanding that there were all sorts of assumptions that we were making about people's home lives um, and that we really needed to pay very specific individual attention to those things because they were going to impact our strategy and our expectations um, across the board. Thank you. Sherry, your thoughts on? on... Well, I think on a personal level, um, I mirror what Cal said. I, I am in a different time and space than many of our staff in the fact that I don't have young children at home, but I watched from afar <laughs> at the massive juggling act that people had to do with a change every day, it seemed, in whether they were in the beginning remote or not remote or in school or not in school or, you know, quarantining or whatever. And I just um, have the utmost respect and applaud um, our team, our staff, all of, all of um, many of you that ha had to juggle that situation over and over and over again and continue to do so. Um, with the different, you know, hills and valleys of our trans, uh, the the virus spreading and and dropping and and all of that. But on a personal level, what I tried to do was keep a very strong routine of self care, and I encourage that for our team as well. Um, I'm a real regimented get up and walk and let my um, let myself really get a, a good, clear vision of what the day um, should hold. As we all know, we can have a vision of the day and then that can never materialize because your plans instantly evaporate when you walk in the door and um, there's a new fire drill to address. But um, to have that routine, to have time to allow yourself to think um, in a CEO position, it seems that you, know, you have a million things coming at you all at once. And you have to remember that you have to take the time to think and process in order to um, come up with solutions that will work, you know, for the for the um, the larger picture. Um, I, you know, as far as the unexpected um, cancellations and and family events and that type of thing, um, my husband and I relocated here, so we we don't have family nearby, but we did manage to try to slip in and take advantage of opportunities to get out of town. And um, I find that that's very important for me personally to, to make sure I build in consistent breaks from um, the stresses and the intensity that come with running an organization to in order to refresh yourself and make sure that you're ready to go and give your very best um, each and every day that you are present, you, you have to you know, listen to that little voice inside that tells you, um, hey, you know, things are getting a, a little bit um, overwhelming, time to step back a little bit, give yourself a breath. And um, thankfully, I had the opportunity to strategically make little trips here and there and keep the connection with family um, alive, um, which I know many people were not able to do. And again, it was, um, you know, just so many heroes in throughout our um, our team and, and the group that we have here at Well Life that just displayed an amazing, uh, amazing and continue to um, display an amazing resilience to the intensity and the um, challenges that this pandemic has brought. Thanks, Sherry. Uh, I, I, and just parent that I was going to say, you know, during that year that my kids were, were at home, if I if I had to, you know, feed you know, three meals a day for almost a year. That was enough to like literally, you know, make me go nuts. But the, luckily that's that's not an issue anymore. But but so just to piggyback, Sherry, on what you were saying in terms of, you know, you're, you're needing to think about, you know, not only your own, you know, um, self-care, but thinking about your staff 
and then their ability to be able to deliver care to your clients. And how do you, so how did you manage that? How did you ensure that, you know, your staff was safe, clients were safe, but also delivering needed services? What was that like for you? Well, it, it definitely continues to be a juggling act, um, you know, especially in today's um, staffing shortage environment, the great resignation has really impacted um, this space uh, because of the type of work that we um, are required to do. Um, we're finding that, um, you know, it's becoming increasingly challenging to get um, staff that really are willing to get out there in the community and do the work because of, you know, everything that's there. But what we've done um, and what we work hard to do is make sure that our staff have all the appropriate PPE, that we address any of their concerns and needs by being very present and um, willing to listen to their um, you know, requests, their, their concerns. Um, I'm, I'm constantly working with our senior management team to um, get the pulse of what's going on, to, to understand, do I need to you know, visit sites? Do I need to get out and talk with staff um, to reassure them? I write a weekly message to our team to let them know what our agency's doing. You know, some, some are more inspirational, some are more technical, some are, you know, like here's the latest, greatest of what's coming. Here's some of the requirements that, you know, with the mandates New York City put out on the vaccine, we had, a, had to communicate a lot of information and really um, try to get people to understand it, it, the requirements that were needed. So a lot, I think having very open, um, transparent communication is a critical element for anyone in this space in order to uh, reassure the staff um, and, and our greatest asset of being our staff that they are valued, seen and heard each and every day. And George, if I can add to uh, on, on Sherry's point, that one of the things I, I found on the communication side, and it actually goes to something Cal mentioned about privilege and and how this pandemic revealed all sorts of gaps in 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 uh, 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 shortfalls, just societally, specifically in organizations and beyond. Um, to, to Sherry's point, I love all of that communication. The thing for me that and our team that I think was a little bit of an evolution was. Um, definitely trying to find how do you communicate early and often, but frequently even how you're communicating where we might not have the full answers or those answers are evolving in ways that might make us all in our group feel uncomfortable. And so to the point about our constant staffing challenges that we're all facing, whether you're an organizational leader, department leader, team leader, all, almost all of us are, are feeling that. And, and, and simply trying to create space where our teams know we, we, we understand, we get it, we're trying, we're, we're, and not just empathetic, but responsive. It goes back to Cal's point about the uh, about privilege and about, you know, this is all in, in addition to right, a global health pandemic and health crisis and an economic crisis. We were also dealing, continue to deal with a reemerging of awareness around social justice crises that our country has been dealing with for several centuries now. But, and so how do you have those communications to at least create space to talk about it, even when you don't have all the answers or they're changing. That was that was an interesting change for us. And Cal, what about you in terms of your workforce and clients and ensuring, you know, their their safety and continuity of services? How did you how did you manage that or or what insights did you gain from from the process? One of the things where we started off, it seems so long ago, right? <laughs> um, was this emergency planning group um, that we never renamed, even though emergency seemed the wrong word at some point, but a diverse group of people from across the organization at various levels that met far too often or maybe just often enough um, to really try and, and parse through um, all the evolving information and make sure, again, I think to echo everyone, this communication being key and trying to make sure that whatever plans we made included the voices of the people who were engaged in direct service workers and 
trying to, you know, what's enough information, what's too much information, how much information is really people just going to ignore <laughs> and because they're busy doing the work. So I think one of the things that really helped us out and probably most people in this space was we could suddenly have all staff meetings, right? Because they were virtual. And our first all staff meeting had close to 200 people in attendance, right? And that had never happened in the history of the organization. So really trying to um, take advantage of those um, communication avenues to find different ways, right? To get the information in front of people. And we also continued what we had been doing before, which was um, each member of the senior management team attends one team meeting every month so that we have a reach across the organization to learn more about people's challenges and to hear from them, you know, about unmet needs. So on that, on that topic around communication, right? So I'm wondering, you know, as leaders, how do you balance or what do you, how, how did you balance the sort of the, the uncertainty of like, you know, literally there was, you know, OMH would say something, you know, city would say something different. The feds would maybe come out with different guidance. So, you know, trying to balance the communication and the flow of sort of correct information down to, you know, your folks with, with just the uncertainty of what was going on and some of the contradictory, you know, uh, um, uh, guidance that was coming out. Um, but with also like, especially at the beginning, it was like, we had no idea what would what it would look like in a month or in three months so like balancing that hopeful you know realistic expectation but with the lack of really clear sense like i i just you know how do you what did you guys do to try to sort of balance all of that and try to titrate that level of communication in a way that made sense darren what, did, what were your thoughts about that yeah, uh, for, for us, it's an interesting mix because, right, uh, I think many of us are probably doing more than one thing and more than one type of site with more than one agency overseeing how those changing and evolving rules are, are going to affect us. So uh, I think uh, either uh, Sherry or Cal mentioned kind of creating a, you know, a, a COVID response, internal COVID response group that could kind of help with a little bit of that. Um, obviously, we, so we pulled in that group. We had um, some of our outside counsel who was reviewing this for a much larger swath of, of providers in the types of areas we were in. Um, you know, some, some of it, some of it was, was helpful to be able to rely on government partners setting a course. And sometimes even if that was evolving, it was, to be perfectly frank, it was kind of easy for us to say, this is what our, you know, our um, government overlords are having us do and how they are having us approach that, right? Um, you know, where I, I found that more helpful than the silence, where it was kind of on us to figure it out. At Greenwich House, we've got a whole, you know, half of our shop is a, a traditional health and human services. It's, it's mental health, behavioral health, uh, older adult services. And then half is, is kind of uh, after school, music school, a pottery school, arts and culture that, that did not have that regime. And so uh, for us, it was actually helpful to look at what our government partners were mandating, dictating, or, or, or um, recommending, and then just applying that universally. Um, but that was definitely a little bit of the, the nuance. And I'd say early on, you know, and certainly each, each evol evolution, whether it was around vaccines and how you're going to handle vaccine mandates uh, around test and, uh, you know, test or vaccine, some of these things. The, the other thing I found helpful and it's kind of a theme for me anyway, uh, across some of this is relying on some network of peers and partners to glean some sense of what they're doing as well and, and kind of crowdsource. That, that continues to be um, a really, um, uh, in some instances it was there for me, in some instances I sought it, but it was certainly one of the things that has really helped me and I think our team navigate some of these things like kind of doing that crowdsourcing and, and making time and space to find peers that can share out. How about you? How did you sort of balance that, that some of that, the communication challenges around the uncertainty and the ambiguity and just re setting realistic expectations? Was that me? Yeah, oh, sure. If you, yeah. Oh, I wasn't sure. <laughs> Um, so I, I think just to e echo what Darren said, um, being transparent about 
our perspective, you know, listening to our government overlords. I, I haven't <laughs> um, used that expression before, but it's a fun one. And that we were going to rely on guidance from New York State, from the Department of Health, from OMH. We have a lot of OMH, you know, licensed programs. And that we were working as much as possible to translate this um, into our settings in ways that people could understand, with the caveat also that we don't know what we don't know. We're not public health experts. We're not epidemiologists. We're not like, I'm not a fan of trying to parse through <laughs> um, research and trying to put give people access um, to those experts to help people process this, um, both in their own lives and in their work lives. And so for when you did all those um, CBC events where you put e epidemiologists in front of people and having Q&A, so really being clear that we're not the experts, that we're trying to thoughtfully interpret um, what we're learning and that things will change over time. Thanks, Carol. Terry, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I think I mirror exactly what um, Darren and Cal are saying in the fact that it's always key when you have um, uh, a crazy amount of information coming at you and lots of different messaging because there's lots of different sources um, that you really look to a, a core group of, of advisors and to make sure that you have the support of, you know, many different perspectives advising you to give you that um, direction that would be, uh, that keeps you out of trouble. Obviously, you know, you want to make sure you're not saying the wrong thing to the wrong group and you got lots of stakeholders out there. Of course, we all have our boards that we want to keep informed and updated as well. And they're in the midst of, of you know, doing the work that they do. So it's, it's hard for them to understand some of the dynamics we have. But I think it was very critical, as Cal said, um, having the support of CBC, of the coalition, of many other advocacy groups, Shinny, you know, there's a lot of groups out there bringing some valuable information to um, provider agencies to be able to understand how to navigate um, the different messaging, how to, how to overcome some of the different challenges that are out there, um, and, and really taking the time to have thoughtful conversation with a group of your team. And once a decision is made, and that was one of the key things that I realized early on, people are looking for a decision. They, they wanna know that whoever's in charge is making the decision and then they're sticking to it and moving forward on it. And that was one of the main, you know, in the early stages, like you said, George, I think we all felt like we were building the plane as it was flying and it was crazy. Um, the intensity that we all experienced in trying to understand the, how the world was changing so rapidly, but um, really working together, not feeling like you're isolated out there on your own, but to realize that you're surrounded by a lot of people, um, a lot of other sister agencies that want to partner and, and come together and really um, brainstorm through what the challenge is, because we all have the same same challenges in, in most instances, you know, maybe just a little bit different flavor um, here or there, but for the most part, we're, we're going through it in a manner that's very similar. And to know that you have the support of your um, peers is um, really critical in helping to come up with some good solutions and communication for your team. Thanks, sure. and just a plug, we will be doing another town hall with the epidemiologist next Monday. So for folks that have not registered, there will be another one, um, you know, which is an interesting sort of, you know, pivot for CBC in terms of what we tried to do and figure out. I mean, in the midst of all of this, um, I gotta tell you, you know, as, as, a, as a psychiatrist, I felt, wow, there should be something that we should be doing. I could be doing differently than just sitting back and, you know, figuring out, you know, all of this, you know, stuff happening. And um, so we did pivot and we, we tried to create this value add where, you know, we wanted to consolidate as much of the information as possible in one place. And we wanted to bring groups together because I would hear from, you know, agency Y like, oh, we're having this issue. And someone else would say, oh, I'm having that issue. And no one was talking to each other in that, you know, I love the, the idea of sort of, you know, crowdsourcing where, where people just come together that are in similar situations and say, well, this is what I did around X and this is what I did around Y and lessons learned. And I think that, 
you know, CBC has a little bit of a role in that to at least convene and let you guys sort of, you know, be in a place where, you know, you can share ideas. But, you know, and then we also pivoted to like help out with the, 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 the purchasing and distribution of PPE equipment. Again, not necessarily something that, you know, I ever thought, you know, I'd be running a little Amazon, you know, sort of distribution center, which we did out of, you know, Sherry's, um, I think it was in Queens location, but thank you for all that. But it was, um, it was needing to be flexible and trying to respond to the needs. So I kind of want to, I'm wondering from you all, like what and how did you um, pivot, you know, away from your main lines of business? Um, like what did that look like and what did you do? And maybe you can share some of those examples. Um, Sherry, what about you? Like how did, what was the, the big pivot for you in terms of like doing something a little bit different? Well, I think just as you said, George, we all became inventory managers of PPE. It was like, I never thought I was going to have to try to figure out how to get everybody some kind of, you know, facial covering, gowns, face mask, all these different kinds of things. And, and we have over 80 locations throughout Long Island, New York City, and it became this massive pivot of trying to figure out um, how to make that happen, to make sure everybody was protected in um you know, I think again, working together with um, your group was a, a great opportunity to really grow in relationship. Um, I think George you and I got to know each other quite well in these uh, in these little warehouse um, adventures that happened during the the early stages with the um, the arrival of the PPE. But but no, it was it was really um, you know. Our programming did not change dramatically because we, we have a, a large part of our programming is housing. And obviously that didn't change. They're still, everybody's still living with us and everybody still needs the care. And we had so many frontline workers that were trying to navigate through, um, you know, the fears and the, the public transportation and all those um, very real challenges that happened and continue to happen um, now. And so we had to maintain that base of operations without many change. But then many of our other operations, and, and a lot of these are out on Long Island, we had to now learn how to do work remotely. And you know that pivot required, I, I kind of equate our organization to a big ship. And in the past, I felt like it took a lot to turn that big ship. But man, we turned it pretty quick. And I think all of the agencies did um, when this when this um, particular um, remote working, you know, kind of happened overnight. So there was a lot of work to get people equipped and able to do that work, and then a lot of um, training that had to go along with it. So those were some of the things that we just had to really work together as a team, have daily meetings seven days a week, early in the morning. And try to figure it all out um, just by talking it through and you know kind of troubleshooting as it came at us. Now, what about you? Where was where was your big pivot? Yeah, I, it, interestingly, uh, on on one of the last points, the I just wanted to raise our single biggest frustration and how we could respond to the challenges were employees that I kept internalizing was the fact that we would have these team meetings about how what can we do collectively as teams or as an organization to support our employees that we knew were just getting stressed and strained and, and burned out and all this. And the items that were coming up were, they just felt too small for the moment. You know, it was, it was a, a, a gesture of gratitude where the reality of what are our teams need, they just needed a break. They just needed some space to reduce what they were doing. And it just, it was such a powerful, for me, just such a powerful mirror or window into the, the fact that the way all of our organizations generally are structured, there's such little redundancy and such little room for anything we might want to do in blue sky times, like professional development, growth, whatever, that in crisis times, you really don't have that bandwidth. And I just felt really exposed um, in not being able to provide what I know, the one thing our teams needed. So like that was just tough to continue to navigate. Uh, and then obviously the great resignation is only adding to those stresses. Um, in terms of the how that then manifested with new things we did. So we, you know, our direct services, most of them didn't skip a beat. Uh, certainly the healthcare pieces and the, the OASIS driven clinics and work that we had, DOH work, um, pretty much after a couple days of a pullback, you know, everybody was right back out in the field and doing their thing. What, what we did do was as an organization that's been this kind of 120 year 
community serving community building group was we we took a quick look around to see kind of how could we deploy the the infrastructure and the history we had um, experiences we had expertise we had to respond to the needs and um, and and two or three really neat partnerships came up quite quickly. The city offered an RFP uh, to do emergency food distribution, nothing that we had done before, but to a, a point I raised earlier about kind of leaning into partnership, we went out and found a Harlem-based MWB that had been sidelined because they had been doing meals for city schools that were greatly reduced. And so we partnered with them, went in for this RFP and you know, uh, out of nowhere uh, started a process that ended up delivering like 250,000 meals to 40,000 New Yorkers over a span of several months. Um, we went in just, just during COVID, we went from uh, serving about 15,000 New Yorkers a year to over 60,000, just because of some of these new little projects that we jumped up with no, no lasting infrastructure. It was these types of, it was a subcontract with a partner on a time limited program. Uh, another uh, project we built up with some philanthropic help was uh, we, we created something called the Neighbor Network, which was, and there were a few groups that did this, New York Airs and several others, but, um, you know, we used some infrastructure we had to start to reach out to older adults. This was before the vaccine and before it was easy to navigate vaccination. At first, it was to try to reduce social isolation. That evolved to help with vaccine navigation, and that was with help from folks like Robin Hood and New York Community Trust and others that were throwing out some COVID emergency uh, programs. So it was it was a lot of just kind of looking around and figuring out where we could deploy our expertise or even just the infrastructure we had to finance and with our, our experience with contract and philanthropic to be some connective tissue between groups that might not have had it. So those are some quick pivots that we uh, we took on. That's great. Now, Cal, what about you? Um, I won't add on to the list of um, sort of how each program um, adapted their services to working through a public health crisis, but building on that theme of how do we support our staff um, and how this crisis was so fundamentally different from any other emergency that we might have lived and worked through because the staff and promoting their safety and well-being um, was um, different from someone coming in and working during Superstorm Sandy or a, or a blackout or supporting people, you know, after 9-11. That are, while our staff are always our constituents, there was another layer of, of um, stress that this put on our staff. So we really, and again, to echo what Darren said, we're talking a lot about public health, but there are two things that were happening this whole time, really, right? Public health and, you know, the rising of issues about the impact of racism um, and the historical and current legacy of racism and its impact on the people who are the majority of our workforce and the majority of people we serve. So for us, we were in looking at how can we one, we, we, this was in the works, but we were able to launch a substantial diversity, equity, inclusion, and access initiative, even in the midst of um, a pandemic. We, we created a, a wellness benefit for our staff, anyone earning under $70,000 access to $500 um, a year to access things that would help them with their health and well being, whether that is their mental health or their physical health, anything that they thought, um, well, it's a prescribed list, but a very broad list of things that they thought were going to help them manage. Um, we added two holidays, you know, a staff anniversary day and Juneteenth, both to, um, for reasons to, to do with equity and supporting staff. And we um, raised our vacation caps and personal time caps um, for a year and a half so that knowing that people really couldn't go anywhere. <laughs> um, and um, so we gave them that flexibility to accrue more time. So those were some of the concrete things we did to try and um, both 
signal our support and meaningfully add to the kinds of support that um, staff could access. So those are, you know, interesting and I think creative ways of thinking about, you know, again, sort of everything happening around us and how do you respond and react to some of the needs, um, you know, of the of, of your constituents, your you know, your your, your staff, right? Um, Darren or Sherry, any any thoughts on on sort of you know what you guys at your agencies that that are sort of similar to. Um, to those those initiatives. Interestingly enough, we uh, to, Cal, to Cal's point and to a point I raised earlier about not feeling like we could give staff time. We did do stuff like extend um, when a uh, a time limit would be on someone being able to use vacation time or stuff like this. Interestingly enough, and and as anyone who, who tried to implement that, Cal, I'm, I'm curious your experience. But while on one hand that was just these great little things that we found that I think could demonstrate some sensitivity to this unique sense of time you know the flip side was that that created this huge challenge with now staff having even more time to take on which we wanted them to take we wanted them to take and, and actually utilize we did some surveying about how infrequently many of our team members were actually taking advantage of their full pto or vacation time and stuff and so you know, we were really encouraging that, but obviously during a time when we were losing staff to burnout and transition and the rest, it did create even more of the same challenge we were trying to avoid. And so just confronting that and, and having to absorb it and live through it. But I, I thought, Cal, it was a great, that was a great example of, of, I think, some of the elements we tried to offer, whether or not they they fully worked as, as intended. Um, uh, or, or not, uh, uh, we, we, we looked at some of those things as well. And, and I think the, the staff uh, and our teams uh, appreciated some of that. Yeah, and similarly, we, we did, the, um, we did um, enhance our DEI initiatives as well by forming a committee, um, adding a diversity officer, and they've been hard at work coming up with some very um, impactful um, policies and um, procedures that we're going to continue to incorporate to make sure that our our team is very well educated and understanding all the different dynamics that go along with having a very um, diverse, inclusive, and equitable environment um, at our agency. Um, we we incorporated a lot of different incentives and bonuses throughout the pandemic, trying to encourage our staff to let them know that we understood that they you know, we're facing challenges both economically and physically just with all the, um, the um, situations that were ongoing. Um, we also, um, you know, encourage staff. We didn't expand uh, the vacation because like Darren indicated, I, I really was encouraging staff, you, you need to take some time, you know, take the time. I know we've got challenges in trying to figure it out and schedule it. And I actually have one individual who was a little bit upset you know, that she was like, I don't really have, I can't go anywhere. But then she let me know. She's like, you know what? I decided I'd do a staycation. And um, it was very wonderful. She really appreciated the fact that, hey, you don't have to go somewhere and be all stressed out about going somewhere. You can just stay home and, and take some time to just catch your breath. And so there were some lessons learned there that, you know, it's a real double-edged sword in trying to figure out what's the right move to make in, in terms of showing appreciation and showing um, acknowledgement of all the challenges um, and, and then still balancing, you know, the, the reality of scheduling and, and understanding how to, to um, maneuver that. But those are some of the things that we incorporated as well. Thanks. I, you know, and I'm hearing all the issues of workforce and as I'm you know, starting to get my my uh, acclimated to what my new job will be at SUS. I, I got to tell you, you know, the 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 first top three things are workforce, workforce, and workforce in terms of really um, grappling with those issues. So perhaps you know, just as a plug to CBC, maybe you know, a webinar on or another panel on workforce issues and challenges and how are we all going to. So I think we're all in the same boat in figuring this one out, and um, I think we got to just put our heads together and do some brainstorming or what, what and how all this will will shake out because it definitely is a, a, a concern. But um, so just, I know that we're, we're you know, running up uh, on time and I just wanted to sort of, in looking back at the last, you know, couple of years, um, and I always think that there's got to be some silver lining, right? And, you know, in all of this, you know, what have we learned and what's the silver lining? And do you guys have a sense of like, what, what are you coming out of this as a, 
not only as an individual, as a person, but like also as a, as a leader of an organization, you know, what, what are some of the, the, what is the silver lining of all this from your perspective, Darren? I mean, I, I, I appreciate the question, George, because I really, I'm a big believer in, in, in really trying to find the, the lemonade out of the lemons. And I think, you know, when I came, I'd mentioned in my intro that, you know, I came in two and a half months, three months before this crisis started. And, and I, my positive take was sometimes there's no better way to, to gain insight into an organization than to see how they respond to crisis. And so like that was trying to a little bit of, on a very personal level um, from a leadership perspective. But, you know, I think the obvious ones, of course, are we all just got a, um, took a master's class in what it looks like to work online and remote. And this is something that I know a lot of employers, uh, when I was over at City Hall before I came here, this was a topic that I was trying to push through the mayor's office. Like, let's have a remote policy so we can all be out and about. And I think any employer, whether you're government, agency, um, uh, private or, or nonprofit, there's, that was a real hesitancy, I think, for a lot of employers to understand, to trust, to create systems, to allow for more flexible workplace and some of this. And a lot of the work we all do is direct service where you have to be on site. But for teams that don't or for teams that can rotate, I think this the silver lining here was um, uh, the rapid introduction we all just had to that. I think the second issue there is, and, 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 and related was, I think there were a lot of folks who would kind of be naysayers around what does and doesn't work remote. And I think we've all experienced that certainly in our caring economy and our caring sector, um, very few things are better than that in-person interaction. You just, there's just too much you can, of the granular nature that you lose if you're from a distance and whether that's someone visiting a home setting or, a, um, or, or just all the little cues you get from an interaction with a person or a group. Um, but, but I do think it, 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 um, it gives us that flexibility. So that, so that, that, that was a positive. And then Interestingly, your last panel, there were two things that came up that that really rung for me. There was someone uh, talked about um, this, the uh, having evolutions and iterations in the service deliveries that we do. And I just think, again, crisis demands nimbleness. And so I think hopefully this is like the, the, the realities of us having to be as nimble as we were during this period and still in it. Hopefully that sticks to a lot of our teams and, and that. And then the last thing, and it's just a word that, that I, I constantly try to um, keep front of mind for me is just being humble in what we know and what we don't know. And just trying to really be present when we're talking to our, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to, whether you're leaders as a CEO or whether you got a team of two, there's, there's a, a there's a sense that you need to have all of the answers because frequently we do need to make, be a final decision maker. That's a reality. But entering into that with some degree of humbleness that of where you can draw those answers from, I, I think is certainly something that, that I've tried to, to really drive for myself personally. And then as, just as a team sharing among, among our peers. So those are a few silver linings that I hope, hope came out of some of this. Thanks, Darren, that was, that was great. Sherry, what about you? Um, <clears throat> Same thing, you know, learning to um, trust that people can work remotely. You know, I, I know there's a lot of uh, concern that, oh, they're just going to sit around and not do anything. Well, you know, it's kind of like I at this point in time, I'm like, I don't care where people are sitting. As long as they're getting the work done, it's fine with me, um, which has created an opportunity for us to reevaluate our office space. You know, and so we're in the process of doing some um some readjusting there and possibly, you know, gaining some financial benefit from these new adjustments that we're making. And, and it truly is a quality of life change for the staff when that can be incorporated in their process. We all know the commute can be kind of um, wearing on, on those that, you know, have any sort of commute. And to lessen that um, to a degree is, is a gain, you know. So, where possible, we found that that's been a, a lovely silver lining for people. Just the utilization of telehealth, being able to start using telehealth as a mode of opportunity in serving people. There, We found that there are a cohort of people that really resonate with that type of uh, modality versus the face-to-face. -face. Um, and just to have more options in providing that type of um, option for them is, is wonderful. 
Um, and then uh, the other thing is, you know, just trying to um, utilize all the different relief funding and things that have come in has allowed our agency to really adjust um, some of our approaches in terms of managing our cash and, you know, keeping things in order in that regard. Um, it's, it's really been um, a, a, a unprecedented time in the way that the funds have been distributed and, and the acknowledgement of the support that's needed in our industry. And it continues, you know, I'm sure for those that are in the OPW space, you just got through the stressful time that, that we faced in preparing some surveys in order to get some funds for our um, direct care workers. And, um, you know, to know that we have the support of the oversight agencies in providing additional um, rewards to the team that put their heart and soul into the work that needed to be done has been a wonderful silver lining as well. Thanks, Sherry. So I heard, you know, humbleness, trust. Cal, what about you? What are what are your silver linings from all this? Um, sort of adding on to, you know, what we learned about the possibility of virtual service delivery always guided by the preferences and the needs of the people we support. But for some people, it is a preference in some circumstances. So really understanding that this decision is, is nuanced um, and always driven by the needs and preferences of the people we support. But we are not going back, <laughs> you know? There, it's so clear, we are not going back to how we worked before. And we're gonna thoughtfully, um, evaluate what that means across our range of programs. And, and yes, we don't need all this office space. <laughs> um, and people who ca can do their work, you know, it's like a role-based decision-making process, keeping in mind all the issues related to equity and fairness and understanding when um, maybe not everything is fair um, because people have different roles. Um, and my biggest lesson I think I learned right in the beginning was we were stronger than I thought. You know, the world changed overnight um, and the entire organization worked together to make sure that we were meeting the needs of the people we serve, making sure that our incredibly vulnerable <laughs> um, service recipients had the support they needed, had the information they needed, had tools to help them deal with isolation and fear and everything else that was um, raining down upon people. So I was like, I'm not like a, an optimist, <laughs> um, but I was like, this is pretty amazing um, to see how we were able to do that and continue to do it. That's fantastic. So stronger would be the word I would take take from all that. So um, so this, th thank you, this was this was great. I mean, it was a, an amazing conversation. I do think, you know, just a couple of, you know, thoughts um, um, to round out. You know, I do think the telemental health issue was was a game changer. I do, I do say, and we put out a position paper on this, but I do think that we do need to look at, you know, who are the right, you know, the right cohorts, the right diagnoses, the right frequency, dosaging, all of that in a much more rigorous way. I don't want to burn this with like a lot of academia, but certainly I think that we do want to make sure that we're, we're utilizing the modality in the most effective way. So, so, but I definitely think it's a game changer and it has increased access, you know, for those individuals that might never have, have um, sought care. And I think that that's, that's hugely important. Hopefully, you know, the city and the state and the Fed will continue to, you know, support some of that evolution as we move forward. Um, so I want to thank you three for joining me on this um, panel. Uh, it's been a, you know, amazing to be able to hear what and how we've, um, you've worked um, in your respective organizations as leaders and also as partners uh, with, your, with each other, with the network, with CBC. Um, I, again, I'm incredibly confident about where, where we're going and, and the direction that um, we're in. So I, I you know, again, I want to thank you. I want to wish everyone um, lots of continued success in their um, continued sort of growth. Uh, I will be, you know, seeing you all maybe in a little bit of a different um, perspective the next go round. But again, I want to just thank everyone for, for making this such an amazing 
um, journey, our ability to be able to pull together you folks in this way has is, is been, is been humbling. So thank you. Uh, I wanna thank everyone on the call, um, the network, our supporters in city and state. Um, and um, thank you, thank you all. And um, we will hopefully be in person someday soon uh, and be able to you know, raise a, a glass and toast to all of our successes. So thank you. Thank you, George, appreciate it. Appreciate the work you guys are doing. Thanks, George. Thank you. Thanks a lot.